This is Twit. Apple just announced new iMacs on Monday, and already our friends at iFixit, iFixit are tearing them apart to see what's inside. Joining us today to talk about what he discovered inside the brand new iMac Intel 21.5 inch Retina 4K display is Kyle Weens, founder of iFixit. Welcome back to the show, Kyle. Hey, thanks for having me on, Megan. So you found some pleasant surprises inside the iMac. Tell us about them. I did, yes. Yeah. So we started taking it apart the normal way. You know, we have our iMac, and I, I have all the, the tools pulling it apart. And uh, we got inside, and the, the main board was a little bit bigger than we were accustomed to. And so this is this is the board. And what's exciting is that right here, these are RAM upgrade slots. And so these are this is the RAM that is inside the iMac. Oh. And yeah, I took it out, <laughs> so it wasn't soldered on the board, which is which is chaos. <laughs> Is this the first time uh, with an iMac that you've popped open where you've found kind of these removable parts? I, I know historically it's been a very difficult uh, computer to upgrade. Yeah, well, a few years ago, the, I think the 21-inch was like this where you had to pull it apart and, and then you could get inside. You know, the 27-inch still has the door on the back of it, but okay. the 21-inch iMac, uh, yeah, so this is in the category of things that Apple says are not user serviceable but actually are. Okay. Uh, so uh, so this is really interesting. And, and, I mean, of course, their baseline, you know, the baseline 1099 model comes with two 4-gig chips. You've got 8 gigs of RAM, which is okay, but it's not great. Um, but, you know, RAM from Apple on their, you know, upgrade path is always kind of expensive through the store. So the idea that you could do it yourself and save some money is pretty exciting. How easy is it to do? Uh, you know, so we rate it as a repairability score of three, which sounds intimidating, but that's, you know, we want to let people know uh, that, you know, there's a bit of a process. Um, so we're actually, we're putting together a kit so people can upgrade it themselves. Uh, and we have a repair guide. Uh, the previous repair guide for the uh, the 2015 4K model, uh, it, it's basically the same process to get inside this. So in order to get inside, you need a few things. I have here, this is uh, the first thing that you need to get inside is a pizza cutter. This is the special I fix it pizza cutter. Uh, I, it'll work on very, very thin crust pizza. Okay, or, good to know. That was my next question. <laughs> or very thin. I mean, this is it's a it's actually a Delrin. Uh, uh, it's it's kind of an incredibly precise thin piece of plastic, and you slide it in, and you're actually cutting adhesive around the edge of this. Apple used to use magnets, and so you could just take suction cups on on the glass and pull it off. But when they wanted to make it a little bit thinner, they had to get rid of the magnets, and so they went with this foam. Uh, and it seems intimidating, but it's really not that bad. You just stick the pizza cutter, you go all the right way around, and you can lift the, the glass off. Wow. Can you use an actual pizza cutter? Would you recommend using an actual? I don't think I would recommend that because <laughs> you might break the glass. And, and with this, one of the reasons we give a low repairability score is from a repair perspective, if you break the glass, it's very expensive because the d glass and the LCD are fused together. So breaking the glass would be the same as breaking the entire display. Uh, so don't do that. Don't use a real pizza cutter. You need our tool. I, we've spent a lot of time kind of tinkering, trying to find something else. I'm generally a fan of like kludgy DIY solutions. In this case, you really want this tool to get it open. Um, it, they're not that expensive. Uh, and, and then you can get inside. And some of the other things in our kit, we've got uh, so this is kind of like a credit card, just a plastic pry tool. And uh, there's there's quite a few different screwdrivers that you need. Um, so we we this uh, little screwdriver kit comes with all of the various screwdrivers that you need, and then it also comes with replacement adhesive. Um, so this is kind of once you take it apart to put it back together, you have to replace the adhesive around around where the display is. Everything in the kit is is under ten dollars. The pizza cutter, um, which you call the right. iMac opening tool, is seven seven ninety five seven dollars right. ninety five cents. So, could you use that to open up uh, an iMac too? Do they use the same? I mean, uh, iPad or an iPhone? Do no. they use that same? No. Yeah, nice thought. No, we, we recommend, I mean, a lot of the tools in this kit, so like the spudger, we use spudgers to take apart iPads and um, and iPhones. Um, but this particular tool is really designed for separating foam adhesive, the kind that currently Apple's only using on the iMacs. This will work on any of the new iMacs. It, so what we decided, what you really want is just to buy the RAM and have a kit. So we're, we put together a uh, 32 gig RAM kit that we haven't launched yet. You guys are the first people I'm telling about. So 32 gig RAM kit with all the tools, on Apple's site, if you want to upgrade your 8 gigs of RAM to 32 gigs of RAM, it's $600. We're going to launch our kit tomorrow for $300 mm. for th 32 gigs of RAM and all the tools you need to do it yourself. Nice. Cool. nice. So if if your time, if you can do it in an hour or two, save 300 bucks, that's pretty good. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, although it's going to feel a little weird pulling that display off for the first time. It's going to feel a little weird about it. I know that that would scare 
scare me a little bit. Um, but hey, that's why I don't <laughs> I don't pull IMAX apart, I guess. And you do right. it for us. Um, what does it mean you you had in your teardown uh, that the CPU is socketed in this iMac what what does that mean about r repairability or replaceability that sort of thing yeah so this is fantastic news uh, and so this is where the the CPU socket or this the CPU was we removed it uh, so this the model that we have this is the low end model so it had an i5 processor so this is really cool this is the KB Lake Intel architecture uh, that's the big reason for the upgrade. And it's a KB Lake socketed processor, which means that if you get the low end iMac and you want to go on Newegg or from someone like us and get a uh, the a higher end processor, you can just drop it in. And uh, we're doing testing now. So we have we're 100 percent sure that it works, but we're like 98 percent sure that a faster processor will work just fine in it. So this was obviously a conscious decision to on Apple's part to allow people to swap out the CPU and the RAM. I mean, do you have any idea why they did this? Uh, so we have, I mean, there's there's two possible theories. One is out of the goodness of Apple's heart, they love us and they just wanted to do it because they love us, uh, uh, which is possible. Although I think <laughs> the last few years maybe have uh, taught us to be a little skeptical of that. Uh, the other idea is that perhaps Apple's at the very bleeding edge of KB Lake and Intel didn't have uh, uh, non-socketed processors that they could use. And so Apple had to, had to use the socketed version. Um, that seems a little bit hard to believe considering how much clout that Apple has. So I tend to... Uh, Maybe they're just, I mean, they understand how much frustration the pros had. I mean, if you look at all the frustration that we have had with Apple the last two years, if you drive it down to its core, it's really been, these machines have not been upgradable. So there's been absolutely no choice. Normally the pros, the folks that are in the top, you know, 1% that are blogging about how much we love Apple or, or you know, or uh, hosting shows like this, uh, we're really passionate and we're willing to do the upgrading. And so by Apple cutting off the upgrade path for the 1% of people that were the most interested, they created a lot of public frustration for themselves. So maybe they see something like this as a kind of release valve where two, three years from now, if they don't get around to upgrading the iMac, hey, that's okay because we'll get whatever the fastest KB Lake socketed processor Intel has and throw it in there. Curious to ask you about this. It's it's only I mean it's it's related to what iFixit does at, you know as a business uh, maybe less so about this particular teardown. But the Supreme Court uh, it was a couple of weeks ago had a ruling um, around people's right to repair their own gadgets. That's kind of what you guys do for a right. living. Uh, I, I have to imagine you were following that closely. What did, what did you think of, of of the outcome? What was the potential impact for you guys? Yeah, we were. I was actually involved in one of the amicus briefs to the Supreme Court, so we were we were very involved in that. Uh, the uh, so the the case this was Lexmark v Impression. So there was this little mom and pop company, Impression, it was buying old Lexmark cartridges, refilling them and reselling them. And Lexmark didn't want them to do this, and they sold them for patent infringement, saying, "Hey, this cart uh, printer cartridge that you're selling infringes on our patent." And Impression was like, "Yeah, no duh, you made it the first time." We shouldn't have to pay you a patent license every time we refurbish the cartridge. Uh, and, and so this had broad sweeping implications because if the Supreme Court had sided with Lexmark, it would have meant that like your used car salesman down the street might have had to pay Ford patent licensing fees for selling a used car. Like there, it was a broad sweeping uh, uh, potential ruling. And the Supreme Court fortunately ruled on the side of sanity and ruled in favor of impression and against Lexmark and said, no, once you have sold the product the first time, your patent rights are exhausted. That's the legal term, exhaustion. Patent rights are exhausted, and so you can resell it as many times as you want. Uh, and so this is a very big deal. It means that folks like us who are like buying used products, taking them apart, selling used parts, that we're not infringing on, on the patents of the original manufacturer. So is, the, is this the end? I mean, do you have to find another cause now? <laughs> well, so, you know, right to repair is complicated. There's a lot of aspects to it. So uh, this means that it's legal to sell used parts. That's great, but there's a lot of other problems that we have. For example, uh, Apple has a magic tool that will calibrate the Touch ID sensor on the, I, if you, on the iPhone. So if you install a new Touch ID sensor, uh, there's no way to make it work without having Apple's fancy machine. Um, so there are right to repair laws being considered in 12 states now that would require companies like Apple sell diagnostic tools and make service manuals available. So no, right to repair isn't one yet, uh, but this is, you know, one step down a very promising road. Well, Kyle, it is always a pleasure to talk 
to you. You also uh, t tore down the new uh, the new Power Books and the new MacBooks. Nothing uh, you can see the teardowns there. But I there... wish there was a new Power Book. There's no new Power Book. Oh, the, the MacBook. MacBook. Yeah. So the new MacBooks and the MacBook Pros, and they are incrementally uh, better, uh, and it basically just swapped out processors inside, and they're good to go. Um, so I'm curious. I want to know if you guys were going to buy a new iMac, like which one would you get, and like what upgrade path would you follow? Like all of a sudden we get to talk about this with a Mac product. It's kind of exciting. <laughs> that is exciting. If you're going to buy an iMac and you've got you know, $1,500 $2,000, what do you do? Oh, I thought oh. you were going to say, if uh, do we both have 2000 Like do, if we both <laughs> we have 25 pool our money together. If we both had 2500 we might get ourselves the new uh, iMac yeah. Pro. I don't, they're they're all looking pretty appealing. I mean, the iMac line is at a really great place right now. I remember when the iMac line was this like almost like a budget, like lazy, you know, lazy direction to go when you wanted to get a, a Mac and you didn't want to go total bottom, but you didn't want to pony up for like the Mac Pro or something like that. And now they've they've got it to a point to where it's really I don't know. They're all very appealing. Uh, obviously. You know, they scale differently for for different capabilities. Personally, I would want as much power as possible, so I'd wait till the end of the year until the 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 big one comes out. That'd be my yeah. choice. But he didn't give us that much money, Kyle. Didn't I know. <laughs> I'd save. I'd save my money. So if you got the eleven hundred dollar one and then max out the RAM and put like a two terabyte SSD in it right now, that would be another maybe five hundred bucks on top. So now you're at like sixteen hundred, yeah. and you've got the low end processor now, which doesn't give you the max power, but that's okay. Wait a year, buy a new KB Lake in a year, and throw it in there, and, which would be, I mean, you know, the the the, Mac, the iMac Pro isn't coming out until December anyway, probably January. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, th I think you can get a lot of the power. I mean, I, I would think if it was me, the lowest end iMac is the most attractive one right now, which is crazy. Yeah. Huh. Well, I mean, I don't really do, I mean, Jason's a musician. He does some of that stuff, but I, I don't really do anything. Like I'm thinking I just need to get more used to using my iPad Pro as a as a laptop because I really, I mean, all that power and everything is would just be for show at this point for me. <laughs> Because you don't you, need you will rip my my laptop out of my cold dead hand, hands. I'm not switching <laughs> to a to an iPad. Yeah, yeah. It cooks life. This one I has agree, had a lot of life in it, and I I'm ready. You know, I was almost tossed it aside for a um a stu a, a Surface Book. So yeah, that lasted I'm, a few days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Kyle, it is such a pleasure. Before you go, I wanted to make sure I found this photo on the internet, um, uh -oh. and I want is that you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is, me. That is the most shattered. adorable thing in the world. Like I bet a lot of people watching here took apart vacuum cleaners as a child or other. I know my Burke children did. did. Burke did. Uh, how old do you think you were there? Well, I must have been like four. <laughs> Uh, and I remember trying to fix the vacuum and I never could, but that vacuum, it would like, it, when it, it got stuff stuck in it, it would like smoke. I remember like uh, the rubber burning yes. smell of the vacuum. <laughs> I know that yeah. smell. <laughs> Well, Kyle, thank you so much. Kyle Weens is at, at kweens on Twitter, ifixit.com, and kyleweens.com. Thanks so much. Thank for you, Kyle. Giving us yeah, your time. We're rolling out this kit tomorrow, I think. Awesome. Right Check that out. Site. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks again, Kyle. Take we'll care. talk to you soon. And we should mention that iFixit is a sponsor of the network, not the yep. show, but the network, and has been for a while. And we, we love their products. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm.